So this slide deck is where we try to simulate or model something more realistic. So we'll see a few concepts that help us spe like model specific things that like, interact with the memory. So, um, so ports in Gen 5 are the interface to move data. Basically, uh, you can move requests for data, responses for data, or requests for writes, requests for reads, all those kinds of things. So I want uh, all of us to start differentiating between request, response, and data. So both requests and responses can have or not have data. So for example, a read request doesn't have a data, whereas a write request has data. Uh, on the other hand, a read response has data, whereas a write response does not have data. So all of this information is encapsulated in a class called packet in Gen5. So uh, ports and packets work together to move data from one end of your system to another end. Uh, a packet encap encapsulates a bunch of information. The things that we concern ourselves with is address. So let's say I want to read an address from the memory. So I create a packet, and I set the address field in the packet to the address that I want to access. There's a data field that may or may not be null, so like depending on what uh, the actual packet is trying to achieve. And then there's a memory command, which can be read, write. Uh, it could be read request, write request, read response, write response. There's a long list of memory commands in Gen5. If you want to find them, you have to go to source mem packet.hh. And then there's a requester ID, which is an, a global ID for the some object that requested or sent the packet. And again, class packet is defined in packet.hh under gen5 source map. So if you look at the port classes in again, source mem port.hh, you'll see two types of ports, request ports and response ports. So the difference between request ports and response ports, uh, as their name would suggest, is that request ports request some service and response ports provide that service. So the initiator of any transaction is a request port. So for example, the port between your cache and your CPU, so there are two ports there. So there's a port on your CPU that is a request port, and there's a port on your cache that is a response port. When you put the equal sign between these ports in Python, they become connected to each other. And when the CPU wants something, it'll use its request port to send a packet to the response port that is connected to that uh, request port. So let's call connected ports peers. So a request port can have a peer that is a response port. Never ever can you see, see two request ports being peers of each other. Um, you'll see in the definition of uh, both request and response port that they have a bunch of uh, pure virtual functions. Again, these are abstract classes. You cannot instantiate an object of that class, which means that in your code, you have to extend them. The pure virtual functions relate to receiving, whether it's a, date, whether it's a request or a response. So for a response port, uh, the pure virtual functions relate to receiving requests. That's basically because the sending is fairly straightforward. You go to the peer, you ask them to receive, and then they have a pure virtual functions that they, function that they have defined. So again, the, the port classes have a set of pure virtual functions that you have to define. So you cannot instantiate an object of request port or response port in your code. So you have to extend. So in Gen5, there are three types of accesses that you can do to the memory, timing, atomic, and functional. So in timing, uh, what you will do is like, send the request. And again, these are more like conventions, or like the developers have agreed that this is how they will treat them. So with timing, you're, like, the requester uh, is assured that that request will take some time. So 
that access will move the simula sim simulator time into future. So that is the type of access that you want to use when you're trying to simulate real things. So uh, with timing mode, requests can be interleaved. They are not guaranteed to finish atomically. Like, for example, when you have two accesses to the cache and they both miss, one of them might finish faster than the other, although this, like, the second one the second request can fast finish faster than the first one because like, it hits in a, a higher level cache. In atomic mode, you still move the simulator time. And again, this, you have to kind of caveat this by uh, saying that it is uh, the responsibility of the requester, the initial requester, to move the simulator time. So every atomic access will basically create the response packet right away. However, it'll return a tick value that is uh, equivalent to its latency. So a few things to note, note about this. Accesses are done atomically, meaning that if, you, if um, access one is going to be serviced in the memory controller and access two is going to be serviced in the L1 cache, in your code, in your C++ code, you'll see that access one is going to be uh, uh, service first, regardless of where in the memory it is. However, it'll probably return a different tick value because it's gone all the way up to the memory controller. And then like your CPU is responsible for moving time. I'm not completely sure whether the CPU models in Gen 5 will move time forward given the atomic latency or not. And then functional mode, it doesn't even return a latency. It completes the transaction. It doesn't even access the caches. It's a backdoor to the memory. It is very useful for like, initializing your memory. If you have a memory image, you want to load into your uh, like DRAMs. So uh, again, we talked about this a little bit. OK, so let's talk about the timing protocol a little bit. So again, we're talking about scenarios. Um, in the, in the scenarios, we have two sim objects, a requester sim object and a responder sim object. Uh, these two, uh, each, so the requester sim object is going, is, has a request port, and the responder sim object has a response port. These two ports are connected. They are peers. And these are possible scenarios that can happen. So, uh, so assume that the vertical lines going down is positive time. So the further down the ladder you go, the the more time increases. So at some point, the requester object, or the requester sim object, is probably going to need some uh, need to access the memory. It'll send a timing request right away, with, like in the simulator time. Send timing request is called, which right away calls receive timing request. Now, if the responder has the bandwidth to service that request, It'll return true. However, that returning true should not be interpreted as that's that request being serviced. So it's kind of like an acknowledgment signal saying, I got this. Now, like, um, the request report is guaranteed to receive a response for this request into the future. So I want to emphasize that that return true does not mean that the requester can immediately assume that the packet is the response of that request. Sometime, again, in the simulator passes, the responder executes what it's supposed to execute to service that request. And sometime in the future, it sees that I have prepared the response for this request. I'm going to send it to the requester. So it'll call send timing request response, which will call it receive timing response on the re requester end. And if the requester has the bandwidth to receive it, It'll return true, and then the transaction is complete. Another scenario is maybe the first time that the requester asks for that access, the responder is busy, right? Maybe you have had too many misses in your L1 cache, and then your L1 cache is like, for now, I cannot do any accesses. You have to stop. So what will happen is that uh, the res requester will call receive time, sorry, send timing request, which will result in receive timing request being called. However, the responder will return false. The requester will say, well, then I 
will wait for you to tell me when to retry again. So the protocol is now the responder is responsible for telling the requester when to retry again. So some time passes, the responder becomes available, like your cache service is one of the misses, and now it can service another miss. It'll, your cache sim object will send a request retry signal to your CPU sim object, for example, and then your CPU can retry again. So and then the cache will res, uh, execute, process, and service the access, and then send the response packet back. So I want to uh, also say that the fact that you have received a retry in a sim object does not guarantee that the, the immediate access will succeed. So when you're designing a sim object, don't have that assumption. So imagine like a crossbar when it has multiple uh, requesters on one side, and it'll send a retry maybe to all of its ports. What, that'll be a race condition, so you're, you're not supposed to assume that your, like your request is going to be accepted. Um, so, and then there are two other scenarios like this, where the requester will not receive the response because it's busy, but I, like from my personal opinion, it's not the most realistic. Like usually the requester assumes or makes accommodations so that when the response is ready, the requester is also ready to receive it. But again, that is a possibility. You can model that in Gen5 as well. Uh, and then there's a scenario where both of them are busy, and then like, there will be some point in, in this whole transaction where they communicate. 